We've all experienced it. We've sat in a classroom or an office which was just so hot and stuffy you found it hard to concentrate and even started falling asleep. Or maybe you've sat in a station or a terminal which was breezy and cold. These are both examples of bad thermal comfort. We construct buildings all over the planet to shelter us from the elements and allow us to do specific tasks. We engineer these buildings to control the internal environment. Each building has a different purpose, and so the design of the internal environment will be slightly different. We can control the internal environment through HVAC, or HVACR, which stands for heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration. These systems can range from a small air conditioning unit for a home or apartment, up to enormous multi-chiller and boiler systems for skyscrapers. All of these systems have one purpose, to control and maintain thermal comfort for the occupants and the equipment within the space. Hey there guys, Paul here from TheEngineeringMindset.com and in this video we're going to be looking at what makes our built environment comfortable and how we can improve bad ones. When we consider what makes a room comfortable, we tend to think of temperature first. That's true, but there are other things we need to consider also, like the humidity, the air velocity, the radiant temperature, the metabolic rate, and also our clothing. We'll go through each of these a little later in the video and discuss how they impact our built environment. But if we think about times when we've been in a room which was firmly uncomfortable, then the air was probably too hot or cold, the humidity way too high, and the air circulation was either not enough or far too much. We can simulate and even compare the performance of different designs quickly and easily using CFD or computational fluid dynamics. These simulations on screen were produced using a revolutionary cloud-based CFD and FEA engineering platform by SimScale who have kindly sponsored this video. You can access this software using the links in the video description below, and they offer a number of different account types depending on your simulation needs. SimScale isn't just limited to thermal design, it's also used for data centers, AEC applications, electronics design, as well as structural analysis. Just a quick look through their site and you can find thousands of simulations for everything from buildings HVAC systems, heat exchangers, pumps and valves, to race cars and airplanes, which can all be copied and used as templates for your own design analysis. They also offer free webinars, courses, and tutorials to help you set up and run your own simulations. If, like me, you have some experience creating CFD simulations, then you'll know that this type of software is usually very expensive, and you would need a very powerful computer to run it. However, with SimScale, it can all be done with a web browser. As the platform is cloud-based, their servers do all the work, and we can access our design simulations from anywhere, which makes our lives as engineers a lot easier. So, if you're an engineer, a designer, an architect, or just someone interested in trying out simulation technology, then I highly recommend you check out this software and get your free account by following the links in the video description below. Temperature The temperature of a room is one of the most noticeable factors in comfort. Our bodies will try to maintain a temperature of around 37 degrees Celsius. This is to keep our internal organs functioning optimally. If our core body temperature deviates from this by just a few degrees, our bodies will begin to fail. We can lose consciousness, go into cardiac arrest, which can lead to brain damage and even death. If we compare the two office designs again for temperature distribution, the first room design has three inlets at the top right with two outlets at the bottom left. The occupants are sitting at desk in the center of the room, represented by these cylinders. As we look at the temperature of the air, we can see that the cold air is pouring out of the inlets and the central grill is discharging directly onto an occupant. So this is clearly a bad design. The person on the left might be quite comfortable, but the person under the discharge is going to feel very cold and will probably become unwell. Now in the improved design, the outlets have been moved under the inlets and only the central duct is being used to deliver the same quantity of air. However, now we see that the distribution is spread across the upper regions of the room, giving a more stable and equal environment. Both occupants now experience the same conditions. When we are too hot, our bodies will sweat. This liquid will form a thin layer over our skin, which will evaporate. As it evaporates, it will carry the heat away and cool us down. When we get too cold, our bodies will shiver. This causes rapid movement of the muscles, which will generate heat to warm us up. So we need to be in a room which is not too hot and not too cold. As a rule of thumb, occupants will feel comfortable when the room temperature is around 20 to 22 degrees Celsius. But this will vary depending on things such as the activity of the person and also what they're wearing. To give you an example of a real-world design, this is an extract from a Sibzi TM31 building logbook for a new office building in London. You can see the building was designed for outside conditions in the summer of 29 degrees Celsius, 
and in the winter it's negative 4 degrees Celsius. The office area within the building is designed to be 22 degrees Celsius with a 2 degree buffer. That means it can be anywhere from 20 to 24 degrees Celsius. You can also see that this one has no humidity control, but we'll look at that a bit later. If you want to get deep into the details of design, then ASHRAE 55 and SIBSI Guide A are some of the most widely used industry guides for thermal design and comfort. I'll leave some links in the video description if you want to check those out. Air Velocity Air velocity is another aspect which will make a big impact on a person's comfort levels. The faster the air moves, the greater the heat exchange will be. So as we see in the bad design, the person on the right won't be comfortable because the air is moving fast over them and so the heat is going to be leaving their body very rapidly. In the improved design, we have a high velocity over the top of the occupants, but this time it isn't falling directly onto them. The occupant on the left might just feel this on the top of their head and probably so if they were to stand up. There's also a high velocity region under the ankles, so some improvements could still be made for the location and quantity of the grills. As a rule of thumb, air speeds of up to 0.8 meters per second are allowed without local control, and 1.2 meters per second with local control. Moving air creates noise too, so that's also something to consider. There are design limitations for ductwork velocity, and we've covered this in our previous video where we designed a simple duct system. Do check that out for more details. Humidity. When we talk about humidity, we're talking about the amount of moisture in the air. The higher the humidity level, the more water vapor there is within the air, and that will make it harder for our bodies to reject its unwanted heat. That's because our bodies sweat to evaporate the heat away, but if there's too much moisture in the air, then the sweat can't easily evaporate and we will overheat. When we talk about humidity, we mean relative humidity, which is the ratio between how much moisture is in the air versus the maximum amount that the air could hold at a given temperature and pressure. For example, a cubic meter of air at 20 degrees Celsius or 68 Fahrenheit with 50% relative humidity will contain around 8 grams of water. But at 100% humidity, this air will hold 17 grams of water. We can read this information from a psychrometric chart, but I won't go into the details of that in this video. As a rule of thumb, people are comfortable in 30 to 50% relative humidity. 60% is quite uncomfortable, and as we reach 70% relative humidity or above, that's when we start to see mold developing rapidly. You'll probably notice this in bathrooms where there's high moisture levels and very low ventilation. We can also reduce static shock by keeping our environment at around 55%. As an example, if I Google the current weather for my location, we can see that it's showing 21 degrees Celsius outside and 43% humidity. And that's very comfortable. I'm quite happy sitting here in a t-shirt. Things like kettles or water boiling, showers or even drying clothes will all add moisture to our environment. So we want to try and isolate these and keep them separated and well ventilated. In homes we can control the humidity using small portable devices. But in large office buildings we tend to use the central ventilation systems. Again, we've covered that in another very detailed tutorial. Radiant temperature. This is the temperature of the surfaces which surround the person. It's thermal radiation. Everything, including you, give off some thermal radiation due to the differences in temperature. We can feel this when the sun shines on us or even just reflects onto us. We can also feel it when we walk past a hot oven or some heated material. And we can even feel it when we place our hand in proximity to a hot cup. We can visually see the source of the heat using thermal imaging cameras. Now these shots I film using a pocket sized camera which attaches to my smartphone. And I use it for inspection and troubleshooting. I'll leave a link down below if you want to check that out. We can improve or reduce the radiant temperature by basically putting a barrier between us and the heat source. Whether it's a shade, a wall or insulation, we just need to block the path of the thermal radiation. Metabolic rate. This is how much energy our bodies will burn and it's mostly associated with a person's level of activity. For example, someone who sits down at a desk all day will consume far less energy and will feel cooler than someone who is constantly moving around all day. The more energy we consume, the more heat we need to reject. We need to try to keep people of different activity levels separated within a building so that we can provide thermal comfort levels tailored to their needs. Clothing. Clothing can provide an insulation layer between the person and their environment. When it's hot outside, people like to reduce their clothing and relax. When it's cold, we like to wrap up warm. Same within buildings, the clothing people wear will affect their comfort. In our buildings and places of work, we provide protective clothing for people working in cold or hot conditions. The problem we face within buildings is that fashionable clothing 
usually isn't practical, so people who wear this will feel the cold more. PMV. Something you're probably going to come across in thermal design is PMV, or predicted mean vote. This takes into account the conditions discussed in this video, and then predicts what the average vote of comfort will be within the building for a large group of people on a scale of plus three to negative three, with the best scenario being at zero. Again, we can simulate this, and if we compare the good and bad designs, then we can see that the bad design has multiple regions within the negative one region, whereas the good design is fairly constant and close to zero. So as you might imagine, the occupants within the good design will be much more comfortable. Okay guys, that's it for this video, but if you want to continue your learning, then check out one of the videos on screen now, and I'll catch you there for the next lesson. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, as well as the engineeringmindset.com.